So I certainly hope that you um, watched that video. So you're going to be asked some questions on the test about um, intubation. Here we have some of the things that you're going to need in order to intubate a patient. So you'd need to have an endotracheal tube. You'd need to have tape or um, a device to secure the ET tube in place once you get there. Um, sometimes you need a bite block, sometimes you don't. You'll need sterile gloves, suction. Um, you'll also need sterile suction and a yanker, so a tonsil tip, saline, a stethoscope, a CO2 um, detector to confirm placement, and a cardiac monitor. So you want to put this patient on a cardiac monitor before you intubate them. Um, a lot of times patients don't really like to have themselves intubated, so you'll see that sometimes we need to give them a sedative like Versid or a paralytic like Sexacholine um, or pain medicine in order to ease um, what they're feeling when we intubate them. Before the patient's intubated, you want to get a brief, at least a brief medical history of why um, they're being intubated what leads up to the intubation, what their last set of vital signs sounds are, if they're um, on any anticoagulants, what kind of allergies um, they may have, um, any lab values that you might have access to. This is particularly important, the presence of dentures, because you need to remove them. They're expensive, and a lot of times if they're not removed before the patient um, they try to intubate the patient, then the dentures get um, broken. And, of course, their last oral intake because when they put that ET tube in place, the airway is unprotected and the patient can aspirate stomach contents. And it's more prevalent when a patient has recently eaten than if they've been NPO, let's say, for several hours. Now, during that, um, things that you need to pay attention to when they did that movie, um, one thing is once the tube is in place, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take your stethoscope and listen over the lung areas to see or hear if you can hear air moving in and out, okay? And in one point you saw that um, they put the tube in and the nurse or the person who was listening to the lung sounds only heard air on one side and that meant that the tube went too far down. So they pulled the tube back and repositioned it and saw that there was air, or when they listened again, they heard air on both sides. That's the first check, okay? After that, the patient has a, a chest x-ray taken, and then they can sort of fine-tune placement if, um, if they need to. But the first thing you're going to do is you're going to listen to the air, um, in the lungs to see if you've got um, air moving in all of the fields. You're also going to listen. You saw them listen over the epigastric. And what you don't want to hear is you don't want to hear a lot of air movement there because that means you've intubated the stomach. And we don't want to intubate the stomach. We want to intubate the lungs. So if it shouldn't be there, but it should be in the lung field. So on that picture where they had all the, the one little X and then all the little green check marks, that's where you should hear air movement in and out. Okay, and um, you saw that um, in the next slide we're going to see, so this is the endotracheal tube. So this is the piece that you'll see hanging out of the patient's mouth, along with this little teeny piggy tail thing with a balloon on it, okay? What that does is it mimics what's going down here in the cuff, Okay, so this is the balloon that keeps the tube in place. So if you can remember what a Foley catheter with a balloon on it, it kept the catheter in place in the bladder. This balloon is filled with air rather than saline, and it keeps the ET tube um, in the patient's lungs. And it also prevents air from coming down alongside so that all the air will go in the endotracheal tube and into the patient's lungs. So when this little balloon, um, pilot balloon is the real name of it, is inflated, then that means that this um, balloon in the ET tube is inflated. Okay, so if you were to look at this and it was deflated, you could be pretty assured that this also was deflated. So sometimes these get leaks in them, so the balloon leaks, um, and sometimes the tube needs to be um, replaced because of that, the balloon leaking. 
So this is the piece that you'll see outside the patient's mouth. You see that there's little markings here. So you want to make sure you know where the patient's, um, let's say their lips are, let's say, or um, where the, the marking ends. So if you go in and it's usually at 29 and now it's at 27 here, then that means you probably have a tube that's moved and you don't want the tube to move. Here we have um, a patient being ventilated and you can see how that ET tube sits in the patient's um, bronchus, okay? And this is the Ambu bag, this is the little pilot balloon, okay? And this is just what it looks like in real life. And over here what we have is the inline suction um, attachment. And here you can see that normally um, we have endotracheal tubes. Women are somewhere between seven and a half to eight. Males are eight to nine. It depends sort of on the uh, size of the patient's airway. Um, if you've ever had surgery and you've had anesthesia and somebody, um, the anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist has asked you to open their mouth, what they're doing is they're looking in the back of your throat to see how big your airway is. And here we just have a little ET tube holder. Okay, so mechanical ventilators. So now that we know how the tube gets into the pl into place, um, we're going to talk about the machines themselves. So there's two types of ventilators in general. One is a negative pressure ventilator and another one is a positive pressure. Now you're going to be more familiar with the positive pressure ventilator because that's what we see more in the hospital. Negative pressure ventilators were actually the first ones that were invented and it was way back like in 1928 and what it was was the patient was completely encased in this machine and a lot of times you would see pictures like during the 50s when there was a big polio outbreak and kids had polio and it affected their respirations and respiratory system they would show these you know happy little matcha dimes kids with their heads hanging out of these big things and they called them the iron lung and what it did was it encompassed the patient's torso and it exposed the surface of the chest to sub-atmospheric pressure. So it was less pressure outside of the patient's lung than inside. And what that did was it passively caused air to go into the patient's lung. Okay. These um, negative pressure ventilators, and I have a picture of one in the next one, um, are only good if the patient is able to um, breathe on there, you know, is able to be awake um, and to be able to tolerate this big machine because as you're going to see, it's quite a contraption. So here you can see that the um, this is the iron lung, so this is a more modern one, but we don't usually use these anymore. This down here is one that you might see on home care. Sometimes you see patients require ventilatory support only at night, okay? And this kind of a device um, the patient would wear at night. They totally cover the patient's chest, okay? And it's difficult for patients because they're so cumbersome. The advantage is there's no artificial airway. The patient can talk. They can eat. The breathing is much more normal. So when we later on talk about the physiological effects and complications of mechanical ventilation, they don't have as many. Okay. The disadvantages is that they're difficult to get at the patient. I mean, they're sort of like encased in this thing. Um, it may cause um, abdominal pooling of blood and decreased venous return to the heart. So there are some complications. You will not see patients in um, who have negative uh, ventilators very often. So this is a um, positive mechanical ventilator, but it's from um, a long time ago. Um, but it was about the size of a washing machine, and it was like pushing a washing machine, maybe not quite as heavy. Um, but it came on wheels, and you can see how big it is. I mean, the thing is huge. Nowadays, we don't have such big things. We have these nice smaller ones like the one here. Okay, they're a lot quieter, and um, they're not, they don't take up nearly as much space in the room which was a huge issue with the uh, mechanical ventilators in the past. And as you can see, there's all these little bells and numbers and colored things and stuff like that. And 
yes, if you were to do this all the time, you would get very used to what all of these numbers mean, um, but you do have the support of the respiratory therapists to help you with this. But the thing that you want to remember primarily is that we take care of the patient and not the machine. And when we start to talk about vent care, you're going to see that that's really our priority. So we talked about how there were all these little buttons and whistles, okay? But these are the vent settings that nurses deal with the most, okay? And you can manipulate anything um, you can think of on these machines. One thing we can manipulate is the respiratory rate. So we can make the respiratory rate go up or down depending on what the patient's condition is. Usually, we'll set the respiratory rate between 4 and 20 um, breaths per minute. Um, Tidal volume, that's the volume of gas delivered during each ventilator breath. Usually, the, um, the vent is between 5 to 15 milliliters per kilogram. So usually, we see that somewhere in the 500 um, to 700 range, depending on the size of the patient. The FiO2, that's the fraction of inspirated oxygen, that's the percentage of oxygen that the patient is receiving. Usually it's between 21 to 100 percent, and it's kept um, at a level that will keep the patient's um, SaO2 at 90 or higher, okay? So this is arterial blood gas, 90 or higher. Okay, and then we have the inspiratory expiratory ratio. Usually, when you breathe in and then you breathe out, your inspiration is much faster than your exhalation. Okay, but this ventilator will allow us to fiddle around with those numbers, and sometimes we want patients to have a um, longer inspiration rather than um, one that's shorter than expiration. Okay. Um, other things is the pressure limits. Um, these alarms, there's a lot of them, but basically there's two pressure alarms. You can have too much pressure or not enough pressure, okay? So a pressure limit that is a high pressure limit is anything that prevents air from moving into the patient's lung. So, for example, if the patient were to bite on the ET tube or if somebody were to um, kink a piece of the tubing that leads to the ventilator um, or the patient was coughing or trying to talk, you would see the high pressure alarm go off, okay? Low pressure alarms basically mean something's disconnected. Either the ET tube has come apart from the vent, maybe the patient has taken the ET tube out, sometimes that happens, um, or one of the pieces of equipment has come apart. That is when a low pressure limit um, will go off. Now, the alarms are good, okay, because they alert us that there is a problem. But remember, the machine just delivers air. And if there's ever a problem that you think you're having with a machine, you can always take the machine off the patient and amboo them by hand manually. You will ventilate the patient yourself.